So uh, unit testing, who here has written a test before in code? Most of you, that's fantastic. Who here wrote a unit test or feature test this week? Less of you. <laughs> so it's around half of you haven't written tests before. Um, I'm kind of of the opinion that uh, writing unit tests and feature tests and testing in general in code is essentially mandatory. Um, I will even write uh, tests during my like personal hack projects um, because I feel like I can write code faster and more confidently when I'm actually writing unit tests at the same time. Um, so that's where I feel I'm at. That, that's obviously an opinionated thing and you could argue it all you want. Um, but my feet are planted. So, <laughs> uh, who was code for? Um, so why do we write code? Uh, are we writing code for computers? No. We're not writing code for computers. We write code for our friends. <laughs> so, um, we write code in English, essentially. It's a, it's a language based off of the English language. We have for loops, where, each, and all that kind of stuff. If we were just writing for computers, we'd be writing in binary. So the reason we write the code we write is so that we can understand it, our future selves, and then also our friends can understand it, other developers, and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, and once you kind of think about code in that aspect, you kind of realize that it's a lot more social than all of us want it to be. Like <laughs> we'd rather just write code ourselves and be happy with it. But that's just not how it works. So here we go. Yeah, so we're writing code for our friends. Um, I kind of covered these. So yeah, and another good point, this bottom one here, is uh, everyone has the best intent when they're writing a line of code. Um, you have deadlines and all that kind of stuff and budget, so we can get frustrated with that. But to be honest, like, we're trying to do the best we can at the time, but I've definitely looked at code I wrote two weeks ago and be like, what was I thinking at the time? Um, so we've just got to kind of keep that in mind and it'll kind of come into, um, hopefully be more obvious later. So why is this relevant? So this is obviously some more uh, opinionated stuff, um, but tests in general, they drastically increase your confidence of the code you're writing uh, and also the code you're reading. So what do I mean by that? So the code you're reading, if you know that you have a function or whatever, uh, and there's a test to back it up, you understand that what that test is trying to test is working. So if there's a bug in a function, you could be like, uh, where is it or whatever, but if you have a test behind it, that bug's gonna be a lot easier to spot because uh, there just might be a missing like part of that test. It's not really making much sense right now, but it'll come more obvious later. Um, what else is there? So yeah, there's a thousand different ways to write the same uh, function. Um, that just kind of means we're all individuals. We're gonna write things differently and we need to be a little bit empathetic to other coders. Uh, we're always gonna think we can do a better job than someone else, especially I've struggled with that where I'll read someone else's code and be like, why didn't they do it some other way? Um, and then later on just have to get past that ego and accept that everyone is their own programmer. Um, so this point here, this is a bit interesting. So we don't care about all the ways to write the same function. What we should be caring about is the code intent. So what is this function trying to accomplish? Uh, that's what we really, really care about. Um, so tests describe the intent of the code, not how the code is doing it. So um, in general, when we're working in a code base, we care about uh, what someone else's code is doing. So someone else's code could be Laravel code. Um, like, what is it there for? What is it doing? What is it giving us? So like the each function in a collection class or like, um, I don't know, a database query. We don't really care what, how the inner workings that is actually working. We care what it's giving for us, what features it's giving to us. Um, so the only time we ever care about how code is doing something, like how a function is doing something, is if we have to touch it. And touching it is like if there's a bug or if, um, we have to add to it, change how that feature works or whatever. Um, so this comes back to uh, tests. It'll get there, I promise. <laughs> so why is that relevant? So uh, experience levels vary in any given group. Um, and your experience level varies day to day. If uh, my team can already test, if I don't have my coffee in the morning, um, I'm terrible and I can't really think very clearly. It's a problem, I'll get there. <laughs> 
But yeah, your experience level. Um, I might be a, I might have been a better coder a month ago than I am right today, just depending on what I'm going through with all my life. So, kind of experience, understanding that, you're just trying to get confidence in code. It's the kind of the point I'm trying to make, and test will give you confidence. Um, so this last point here, um, uh, kind of the last point. I didn't want to get too deep into this, but we're working with inexperienced programmers all the time. We have uh, graduates in our teams. Um, some of them are fantastic. Some of them need more help and more training. Um, but we're just going to have to keep them in mind. So, for example, my old company uh, worked in a big uh, product company because we had one big product that we sold. Um, I would say our graduates were able to touch about 95% of that code base, and 5% was just complex legacy crap code that we kind of like, okay, senior developers work in that code base because it's so easy to break something. But everywhere else, um, we could get grads to work in. And it was because we had everything tested uh, that we knew that if they were going to break something, they're more likely to break something, <laughs> um, that we were confident that it was going to get to production OK and we were going to be able to spot those problems. So, OK, I'll just show you some code. Uh, right, oops, sorry. Don't see it. Cool. Um, is that coming up all right? Does everyone see that? I can make it bigger if it's all right. What about the slides here? Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to try and do now, uh, for, people, for the people that put their hands up for they write tests every week, do you guys write your tests at the same time you're writing your production functions, or do you kind of write them after you've written your production functions? You're trying to do them before? See, so yeah, yeah, what's going on? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> One guy. <laughs> the outside of this room, uh, one person can say they do test driven development. Um, awesome. <laughs> so, uh, I'm going to write some very like simplistic beginner um, Laravel code, but I'm just going to write my test at the same time. And I think if I just show you guys that, it might be able to convince you that this is a lot easier and less scary than you think it is. Because I think people see tests and they just see more code. That's got to be a waste of time. I'm just writing more code. Why would I write more code when I can write less code and get the feature out there into production? Um, like I said before, I'm convinced that I write code more or less at the same speed um, when I'm writing tests. There's some exceptions, but more or less. <laughs> OK, cool. Uh, let's start from our test. So down here um, in Laravel, for the half of you who haven't seen this folder before, so there's uh, test. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so there's uh, this test folder, um, uh, feature folder, and a unit folder. So um, feature and other testing frameworks, if anyone's worked outside of uh, Laravel before. Um, it could be like a, they could call them services. Um, they're different, but in this context, it's kind of good to think about the same. So Laravel has your feature and unit tests. Um, a feature in Laravel is like a route endpoint. So it's not entirely clear straight away, but it could be a, um, also like a command endpoint, like a console, sorry, console endpoint could be a feature. Um, but more or less, it's an endpoint because your users can get access to it. They can execute that endpoint and that feature. Um, but they can't execute like a model query randomly. They, they can't get to that part of the code. This is code we're exposing, essentially. Um, so that's your fe features. So I've written this uh, student controller test. Oh, sorry, I've got to tell you what the, the makeup of this tiny repo is. Um, so I've got these models here. Uh, I've got school, student, teacher, very simple. Um, a school, there's one school, uh, a school could have many students, school could have many teachers, and there's a many, many, many to many relationship between students and teachers. Cool. Okay, so let's go here. Um, so I've started writing this test already, uh, but essentially we just want to get, write a test that gets the students by name. Um, so, uh, writing a test name should be kind of like writing like a um, like a Scrum story, uh, or like yeah, a Scrum story. I get most of us probably write stories for our requirements and all that kind of stuff. Um, but 
what we're trying to do. We're just trying to test that we can get students by name. That's all we're trying to do in this application. Um, a bad name would be like student's name or something like that. That like it's just okay. Oops, I missed the test there. Um, so just be as verbose as you want to be. Make it easy to read. Um, I'm using underscores because sometimes if you have like a complex function and you don't or can't like really refactor it, these names can end up being like quite long. Um, so just do underscores. Otherwise, if you're trying to read uh, camel case and it's not fun. Uh, <laughs> so uh, response, what are we doing? We're trying to get students. So this line here, um, we've got this get. So this is just doing a get request, kind of like your browser does, like an Axios get request. Um, if you guys use that or uh, Ajax, whatever. So this is just simulating that. Um, so if we go web, get students, and uh, we're going to point that. We're going to point that at a student controller. And right, that is nothing in here. Um, student controller class. And we're going to point that. I'll just go get by name. Let's not worry too much about anything else right now. I think that's right. Yeah. Flatterable changed the syntax recently and it confused me. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, and then in our student controller, let's just write a function uh, get students by name. I think it's the same. Oh, get by name, there we go. Students, there we go. Cool. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, what? <laughs> Awesome, thanks, mate. It's coding in front of people, eh? <laughs> You're always going to miss dumb You're stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how we go. I can still run away. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So let's just return a response. Um, 200. I like using the response function. Oh, content, whoops. Uh, hello. Uh, 200. So I like using the response function. Not everyone does it. It's just more vote both for me. Um, student controller test. Uh, let's just try and see if this works. See if I've made it. <laughs> so uh, PHP. Oh, I was clear all that. PHP artisan test. Um, Do I talk about this? So the PHP artisan test. Uh, it's just a Laravel wrapper around PHP unit. Um, so I can run like PHP artisan test. I ignore these. I was fiddling with my environment, and I didn't fix it. <laughs> anyway, uh, and we can see here that our test actually passed. But yeah, so PHP artisan test is just a wrapper around PHP unit. So if I go vendor um, bin PHP unit, so we PHP, uh, PHP unit lives inside of uh, Composer. Um, it actually do the same thing, just in a different format. So PHP artisan test will spit it out like this. PHP unit is just spitting it out like this. Um, I actually prefer PHP unit, I might show you later, but it kind of gives you a bit more detail. Um, but it doesn't really matter at the end of the day. So, back to where we were. Uh, student controller test, so that's passing. Cool, we're actually getting to this part of our code. Now, this may seem like super trivial, but I'm super confident that this is working now. If I hadn't have messed this around, I knew that my, a lot of people will write their production code, they'll go, I need to write this big feature, and they'll write, 20, 15, 20 lines in one go, they might do a couple of page refreshes in like the browser or whatever. It just drives me mental. Because um, a bug might happen in like the first line of their code. They might have had that mistake I had where it was pointing at the wrong function. They might have students instead of students. And then you end up right, having all this production code and then going through it after you've written it line by line, figuring out what your bug was. And if you did something really silly, you might have to end up rewriting your whole function because you didn't test it as you were going. Is that making sense of <laughs> not leaving one behind? Cool. Um, so I'm confident. I'm a confident developer, and that's what I want to be. Right, so the next thing. Uh, we need to get students by name. So uh, let's pass in a query string. Name equals Tom. Uh, and then 
Uh, where are we? Student controller. Um, and let's validate that. Request, oops, what's going on there? Press request. Request, validate. Uh, I'm just going to do the old syntax because I'm uh, used to. <laughs> Cool, and then I'm just going to run my test again. Let's see what happens. Uh, it should pass because I've got name Tom there. I'll go to and test. Yes, I'm good at this. <laughs> then if I change it, it fails. So 302 redirect. Um, if I put it back to name, it'll pass. So now I'm still confident. Know exactly what's going on. Um, another way I think about this is. As uh, developers, as you get more and more experienced, um, you get better at managing the code execution stack in your head. Our brain builds up these connections better and better about how to kind of keep in your head about exactly what's going on when we execute um, code. So you'll find with uh, like junior developers, they might get stuck on like three lines of code with a controller, and like I don't know what my problem is, and then they, you don't they don't realize that they're just going to go up one level and maybe into their route or their middleware or whatever. And then they'll be like, oh, that's where the problem is. They'll get stuck in these little, um, I did it 100%. 100% I did that when I was um, first learning to code. Uh, but yeah, they can get stuck in one spot. Anyway, I can't remember what point that was. <laughs> um, cool, where do we go? So name, we got that test passing. Uh, well, that's all passing. Cool, so we need to get by name. OK, so let's, uh, I'll just tidy this up a little bit. Get rid of that guy. Um, let's assert. Or res let's assert some stuff's coming back. Probably don't need him right now. Oh, I'll just leave him. That's right. Assert JSON, um, and then we'll assert that uh, we want to get many students back. So we need a nested array. Actually, I'll. Here we go. And at least one of the students need to be Tom. Uh, cool. Um, so this is a loose matching, uh, this is cert JSON. There is an assert exact JSON. If you wanted to make sure the JSON come back is exactly what you want. Um, but all these functions that I'm using are just PHP unit that Laravel includes. Laravel is built up from many different libraries. Um, PHP unit's one of them. Um, and these are also in the Laravel docs. And then if you dig into the PHP unit docs, there's a lot more stuff there. It actually gets kind of complex sometimes. Um, but just try and stick to the um, Laravel, stuff in the Laravel docs as much as you can. Cool. Uh, right. Oh, also, if you guys have any questions or anything, just feel free to put your hand up and jump in whenever. Um, if you don't understand one part of code. Okay. Invalid JSON was returned from the route. Invalid? Get students by name. Oh, I see. Because we're probably not returning an array. Is that it? Yeah, there we go. This is what I was looking for. I don't need to find JSON. So uh, it's looking for this within the JSON response here. Um, and then here, down here, uh, you've got your expected and your actual. I think this structure of how it tells you is actually not great, but you get used to it. Um, so expected is the dashes. So this is what I was expecting here, but it actually got this back from that um, request. So just to reinforce, uh, what's going on is this get function is like a browser request. So it's saying, I asked for this. Oh, I was expecting this, just like you would in a browser get request, but it actually came back with that. Cool. So we're gone red. If you guys heard the red green testing uh, before, we as you write test, you should be going red green, red green, kind of catching up with yourself. Um, right. So student controller. Uh, let's get some students. So students equals student uh, where name is Tom. Get. Uh, and then in here, we'll just return students instead. Awesome. Let's run that. Oh, classic. Cool. Still failing. 
And that's because we're not getting back. There's no data in the database. How do we manage having data in a database in a test? So in uh, unit testing, you have two databases. Well, not in unit testing. In your, when you're test driving development Laravel, there's two databases. There's your normal database for development, where you uh, do all your browser stuff and you're just regular developer. And then when you're writing unit tests, that's all, um, that's an empty database essentially that gets populated as your tests run. Um, and then ideally it'll clear um, between each test. So you need to set up your state in a test. So uh, st state in code or whatever, um, to be honest, it was actually a word that kind of threw me off when I first heard it, because I didn't hear it until after I graduated, and it just seems ridiculous. But, <laughs> but test uh, state is like uh, what data is in your database at that exact point in time. So if uh, I have one row in a users table and the name is Tom, um, that's a different state from having another database where there's a row in the table that has a name of Aaron or whatever. Um, so we've got to set up our state that our application is, is in at that time. Um, and state can also refer to how your application is set up and what objects are initiated at the beginning. Cool. So um, how we set up state in, in a test, uh, we can leverage factories, um, which you may, you can use factories outside a test. It's for faking data, essentially. Where is he? Database factory. So I've written these factories here. Um, not to be confused, I've seen people get confused between factories and seeders. Typically, you don't use seeders and tests. Um, there might be some cases you do, but seedings for usually seedings for seeding data into your actual um, development environment, or maybe in rare cases your production environment. I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but you'll be using factories for uh, your test. So if we look at a student factory, uh, it uses this library called Faker. So you just make Faker name, um, and then if you want to have a school associated with a student. Um, you can just call the factory on the school. Uh, so yeah, pretty pretty straightforward. Um, this is actually new syntax as well in Laravel 8, I think it came out. Um, so there is a, if you're using uh, previous version to Laravel 8 still, um, which is fine, <laughs> uh, there is a library that'll um, let you migrate to Laravel 8 but still use your old factories. Uh, it's in the docs, I think, as well. So it's not that, it's not too bad to find. Um, right, where will we be? S setting up state. Okay, let's uh, make some students. Student, uh, and then it's, I think it's factory from memory, and then create. So that'll just create a random student, um, but we want to overwrite the random name, and we'll make it Tom. Cool. Oops. Yeah, I think this will work. Should I write in here? Yeah, let's give it a go. Yay, cool. Test-driven development. That's what we're doing. <laughs> right. Uh, any questions so far? Or if anyone wants to add anything on? Um, I'm going to dig a little bit more into a bit more of the theory, and then I'll come back and kind of dig into the uh, more um, unusual testing things that we have to dig into. Uh, would, when do we need to stop as well? By the way, I don't want to run too long for everyone. Okay, I'll, I aim, I'll aim for seven. <laughs> I don't want you to be like, oh, we've got a hard stop at like quarter to seven or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you still the red light. <laughs> Okay, cool. Uh, where were we? Do just show me some code. Um, okay, so there's back to some uh, theory behind it. Um, there's this thing in testing that you guys have probably seen when you Google what is testing. Um, it's this testing pyramid. And the idea behind this is how, what test should you be writing for your code? So in Laravel, we're mainly focusing on these bottom two. So like I said before, Laravel uses the word feature. Um, so you've got your feature and unit test, and there's the UI test. UI test usually for your front-end developers, so I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> but uh, no, essentially UI test is like you you have uh, you do like a mouse move, click on a button, 
it does a full request to the, the back end, does all the level execution cycle, then comes back and they assert that everything ran correctly. But this represents how many, like how much of your code base should these tests be covering? Um, so like a UI test, um, or end-to-end -end testing is the other word, they should be covering about no more than like 10% of your system. And it's only really for like real vital parts. And the reason for that is because you're a pain in the ass to write. Like I, I hate writing them. It just takes so long. Um, so like maybe like high traffic areas, like a login um, will have a UI test behind it or like a create will have a UI test behind it. Um, that's the best places for them. Because that's where if stuff breaks, it can like ruin your day quite severely. So you really need to have confidence every time you're pushing out these vital bits of code that are going to work. Um, and then your feature tests, uh, kind of like, uh, like for us on Laravel, like in this pyramid, it, it looks like probably 30, 40%. But in Laravel, it's going to be a bit different. And then in this pyramid, it says unit tests are like the bulk of uh, everything. Um, so like a unit test, like I think I said before, is testing a very specific part of code. However, this is a Laravel talk. Um, for us as Laravel developers, we already have the framework built. We're just trying to build features. That's all we're really doing at the end of the day. Um, I know some of you guys are building libraries, so it's a little bit different, but <laughs> most of us, we're just building features, trying to get good code out for our clients and that they can use. So, click, throw that away. So it was wrong. <laughs> this, is my, this is my triangle. So <laughs> for us, and it's, the portions are off, but for us, like everyday Laravel developer, Laravel developer, we're mainly writing feature tests um, and very few unit tests because uh, the way PHP works as well, it's very short execution cycles, not like in game development or app development where the execution cycles can go on for a long time. Um, we're dealing with less than a couple of seconds at a time um, for a full uh, execution. Um, so yeah, we're mainly running feature tests. Uh, obviously, like I said, if you're getting into like library development, actually stuff where you've got to be super, super confident, yeah, dive into um, more unit tests. Uh, oh, that's, whoops. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, when should I write a test? Or when should you write a test? Um, when you're writing a brand new function, just test drive it, like I did right then. Uh, it, it, some functions get extremely complicated. Something's better than nothing, end of the day. Uh, if you're not, if you're just asserting a 200 response and not actually asserting any JSON back, it's better than nothing. You're running that code. If you somehow pushed out a 500 missing semicolon, or whatever, shouldn't happen. Should never happen. Um, but at least you'll catch it. Um, I'm going to dig in a little bit later to uh, when you run your tests and to get to production environment. Um, but yeah, so you should write your tests when you're writing a new function. Um, you should also write a test when you're touching an old function that already exists. So, for example, um, if you get a feature change come in um, or you find a bug, while you're there, write a test. It's usually not that hard. If something's better than nothing, just assert the status is correct back. It'll only take you a couple of minutes and your confidence will go way up in that, in that function. Um, but what about for code that's not, not covered that's already in production? So like if you're not touching it, should you go back, if some, somehow today I convince you to be the best test-driven developer in the world, should you go back and write tests for all your production code that already exists? No. <laughs> Your users already test that code. <laughs> some happy users here. So. <laughs> I was, there's one right there. <laughs> I actually noticed that one I put. Anyway, sorry. Um, <laughs> it's true. Anyway, um, where did I get to? Uh, yeah, it's already out in the wild. We have error reporting set up. We already know. We would have known. We, we should have, have already known if there was a bug out there. Don't waste your time going back through every single function that exists in the system um, and writing unit tests. When you come back to it, yeah, sure. But it's or it's already it was already live. Doesn't matter. I think I've honed that point. Um, cool. Any questions so far? Everyone's doing okay. <laughs> cool. Um, code coverage. 
So PHP unit has a coverage tool to show where your tests cover. So the general idea is you want to aim for perfect world. You'd be aiming for 90% of your code base to be covered by tests. Um, that would be like starting a brand new product and writing tests as you go. Um, sometimes it, if you have like a wacky if statement that has like crazy state required to, to actually get it running, you might just be like, it's going to take me three hours to get that if statement working correctly and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not going to bother. So that's your 10%. That's your, your leeway. Um, so yeah, so just when you're installing it, you just got to use xdebug. Um, xdebug's a PHP uh, debugging tool for everyone, anyone that hasn't used it. Um, I don't know why I put that in there. <laughs> uh, but actually, what I'll show you first before we get to that. Um, is this coverage tool running? Um, and so uh, what I've done before is I had it running on a nightly build because it does slow down your actual unit tests. So we have a nightly um, task that would run because I think it took like an hour to run that coverage test in my old company. Um, but it would, so the morning you could come up and see what your coverage is at that day or whatever. To be honest, I only looked at it about once a month. Um, but I'll, I'll bring it up and it might, it'll make more sense. So. Uh, if we go back to, where is he? Uh, let's just look at the functions that are in here. Um, so there's all this stuff you can do. So what I'm looking for here is this coverage um, HTML. Uh, and I think it, the second, it takes a parameter for the location. Uh, yeah, do. So where am I? So I'll just put that into public slash coverage. Yes, it ran. Um, and then, wait, what's my test-driven demo? Slash. I've and this is what it looks like. Uh, we just generated that just then. So I'm doing very badly at the moment. Um, a lot of the stuff's just, I guess, generic. Oh, yeah, this would be my, um, these aren't being called anywhere in our tests. Generally, all your model functions will end up being green at the end of the day because your controllers are calling them. Uh, but if I go to uh, HTTP, let's find the one we wrote. Controller, yeah, nailing it, 100% um, student controller. Cool. Now, uh, I'll show you also what happens if you, we'll throw an if statement in here, make it interesting. Um, let's just say if the request name is, let's go Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. <laughs> um, bail, can't look up Aaron's. Um, and then let's run that again. Cool. Push that and here. So now it tells us code that we haven't covered in our test. So that's your that's your if statement, figuring that out. Um, now, how would you actually test this if statement in your test? So I'll go back here. Now, this is going to seem seem a pretty pretty frustrating for a lot of you guys. What I'm about to do, um, but I have reasons. Hang on. So if I just grab this, I'm just going to paste this. Test students, get students right, but not Aaron. Oh, that's a bad name. Test get uh, test naming functions. A eh? test getting Aaron <laughs> returns four oh four. Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> um, so I can leave that there. And let's just change that to Aaron. Um, so what the reason you guys some might like yeah some of you guys might not like this is because you see duplicate code here. You see this guy and this guy in the same class, and you're like Tom, that's duplicate code. What are you doing? Um, the way people re manage tests is very like concise. Like if you have a test fail or whatever. You're going to jump to this file and you're going to go straight to this function because you know exactly what function is failing, what test is failing. 
And if I abstract this out into like a common function or whatever, I then have to jump around and I like, go to a different file, figure out how the state's actually being set up. And I've come across some like obscene situations of such like complexity of the way they're managing state when it comes to tests that it can take me 15 minutes to be like, how the heck did this other developer set all this up? So my philosophy here is duplicate test and duplicate code, sorry, in tests isn't that much of a red flag. Tests should be more concise to themselves because that's what you're looking at. You're looking at a single point of failure. You're not, you're not really even looking at the entire class like you are for a lot of other functions, a lot of other parts of our site. Um, so this is fine. Anyway, let's assert status 404. Uh, let's see if it'll run. Cool. We ran two. Did we run both those? Yeah, it looks like it. Um, and then if I go code coverage, and then we green again. So each uh, function or each controller function or whatever, you'll have you will have multiple tests for, and usually it's to just to grab if statements, or you might have a a loop that won't run if you have zero things in an array. So you're like, okay, I now need to populate that array so something will run in that loop and whatever. So there's a few situations, a lot of situations, you're 100% going to be more running, uh, writing more than one test. Cool. Uh, right, where was I? Let's go back. Okay. Um, now we're getting to the stuff that's probably a little bit more interesting. Um, have I convinced anyone so so far? Does anyone want to go to write a test that wasn't going to write one before? No, everyone's just like <laughs> getting a few eyebrow raises. Um, so setting times in tests. So uh, I assume most of you use uh, carbon. Um, quite a lot. Um, so just for those that don't use it, you can just call the now function and that'll return a date time, carbon date time object. Um, now, the carbon looks at your computer for the time, your whatever you set it at. So in a test, what you can just do is, uh, where's my test? I'm just going to throw this in here. I'm not going to write. Um, oh, actually, I had this. I actually set this up. <laughs> uh, I'll just change. Cool. Example control test. That's good. I almost forgot about this. Um, so all these these this example controller test uh, class I have here is just uh, these. Um, points here. So, uh, like I said before, so you have your now function, um, and there's this uh, keyword here. So you can just go carbon set test now, and it just hard codes or whatever the phrasing is to make sure that your computer is set to a certain time. So, like if you wanted to, if you had a bit of code that functioned differently if the previous day was the previous year, you could test that using this. Um, so, what I'll do. Artisan, uh, artisan test. So there's this filter as well. If you want to only run, run one test, you can use this filter flag. Test current day. So that's failing. It's expecting the current day to be the first of the first 2021, but it's coming back with today. So let's turn this on. Um, or maybe I can uh, example. Where is it? There he is. Uh, yeah, so it's just returning now in the New Zealand format, um, the function that I'm testing. Turn that on. Uh, test get current day. Oops, carbon not found. Classic. Oops, the red do. There we go. <laughs> yes, green, red, green. That's what we want. Um, okay, where do we get to? Spies and mocks. Okay. Um, is any, have you 
how many of you guys have worked with the service container in, in Laravel before, or, or have fitted with that part of Laravel? That's typically not something a lot of Laravel, develop, uh, Laravel developers have touched in my experience, but um, essentially the service container is one of the reasons Laravel got popular in the first place. It was one of the big PHP frameworks to take advantage of this um, pattern. I can't remember the name of the pattern. Inversive control? I, yeah, I think so, that pattern. Um, and the service container helps uh, manage that. So uh, when Laravel boots up, it has all these different objects that get booted up with it. And they all get put into the same spot um, mentally, well, like metaphorically in, in Laravel, and that's called the service container. So I think in um, Laracast, for anyone that has watched that, um, the guy who runs that describes it as like a giant toy box um, where you can just uh, put whatever toys you want in there in the service container. So like the request object is one of these toys. Um, query builder is like another one of these toys that you can all get. So you can kind of get it any time. Um, and the reason we like this is because it allows us when we run a uh, test, we can swap out one of these toys for something else. And as far as the application is concerned, it's the same code, but that code will act differently um, for our test. So a good example could be uh, if you had a service class or just a class in general that did an HTTP request to another server or whatever, um, you could swap that class out with one that didn't do that request, but just returned, hey, yeah, it worked fine. And as far as Laravel knows, it's like, great, this works perfectly. So um, the way we swap out things from the service container is using uh, spies and mocks. Um, now, this, the word spy threw me at first when I learned about them. Um, Pretend that it's like uh, a object or like another toy infiltrating Laravel and it's just pretending to be part of everything and being normal, like a spy. It's like trying to act normal, but it's doing different things. Um, that's the way I think about spies now. It didn't, took me a while to get that metaphor on my head. I think that's why they called it spies, to be honest, but I don't actually know. <laughs> um, okay, so let's test spying on a class. Oh, I actually have to dig into how... Uh, kit and spy, so where's ego? So I checked out before, that's why these new functions are here. Okay, kit and spy. Okay, so here, uh, since I'm doing, um, I have this new class called foo, um, and that is just living in my uh, services foo. It's just returning kitten names. Um, so uh, this is what it's called. So this, by doing this syntax, I'm leveraging the service container. And I actually have another little bit. I don't want to dig into this because this is a whole other talk in itself explaining how providers and containers work. Um, but essentially, I have a bit of code in here uh, that looks like this, which allows me to do that. Um, but yeah, so this is leveraging the service container. That's all you need to know. Uh, so kittens is foo get kittens, and then I'm just returning that response. So let's run that test and see, we're just doing get to the kitten spy, run that. Oh, it passed. Why did that, oh, because I'm asserting status 200. Okay, that's fair. Let's uh, assert some JSON back. Assert JSON, oops. Usually I work on a much bigger screen, so these, Things are coming up and throwing me off. <laughs> uh, so JSON, and let's see if we get a kitten called Larry back. Um, okay, that failed. So same before, I can't find this within Stephen Mittens. Uh, but what I can do, uh, leave it there. We'll turn this on and this on. Spine class, where did I get to? This is a more difficult bit I wrote before I came here, so <laughs> get kitten spy suit JSON. Oh no, this is the wrong example. I've got to take that out. Sorry, that's for the mocks. Um, yeah, yeah, that's why. Uh, what I wanted to demonstrate here is that when I spy on a class, um, it no longer calls any of the functions in that class. So if I go to uh, foo and I just put like, DD here, 
where we would expect the execution cycle to stop, but with the spy in play, it will still keep going. And so when a spy is in play, he's not, the spy is not executing any code. He's just telling everyone else he's executing the code. So there's something else to keep in mind, and that's not a bad thing. It's actually incredibly handy. So uh, if we go back to here, so I'm just saying, hey, spy, you should have received this get kittens function, and that's always going to tell me. Um, and that is handy when, like, you have a controller that's calling a service class, um, and uh, that service class does, like, a ton of stuff. Like, a, a, you just don't care about testing that right now. You just want to know if your controller logic's working correctly. Cool, so that's working. Uh, okay, mocking. Mocking's very similar to spies, um, but it allows you to, uh, at, like, it allows you to, actually I'll take that back, um, make it fake a certain type of response. So if I go here, uh, so JSON, Larry, why did that, did I get that right? I don't know why that passed. Shouldn't, ah, oh, did I not save? Maybe that's why. Oh, there we go, because I've got here, there. Okay, I just didn't save it. <laughs> Uh, let's get rid of that guy. Okay, cool. So, I need to find JSON Larry within Stephen Mittens. Um, but let's tell the, um, let's mock it. So, mocking's also real with service containers and all that kind of stuff. So, let's mock foo, swap out that toy with a different one. Uh, you should receive uh, get kittens uh, once and return Larry. And then our request is expecting Larry to come back. And it passes. So mocking, similar to spies, but you can define what actually comes back. I don't think there's a way to do it in spies. The thing I don't like about mocking is that you have like a test assertion happening up here, whereas in um, other tests, often you like will set up the, you'll set up the um, the state of the of the test, then you'll execute the production code, and then you'll make a bunch of assertions. That's generally what the structure of tests looks like. So state production execution assertions. But with mocks, you can't do that. And it's kind of annoying to read sometimes, unless you're aware of it. Cool. Um, and then like here, I could change, I think I can change this twice. And yeah, it got called exactly, should be called two times, but got called one time. Awesome. Uh, where do I get to? Uh, testing private functions. I think I wrote this in the end. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, essentially, you can test private functions. Just don't, if you can help it. Um, there is a way to uh, get to, to do it. You can actually just Google testing private functions in PHP unit. Um, and you've got to set up a thing called a, a, re a reflection class or reflection, yeah, <laughs> getting nods. Um, uh, and allows you to set a private function to be um, accessible. I think I've done that twice in like the last four years and I hated it. And then also what happened is that a, a more junior programmer saw that, grabbed it and put it in production code. And I was like, oh dude, and I was like, I gave you the keys. And <laughs> but we called it in code reviews, so it was okay, but it was just if you don't have that understanding of what public protected and private functions are, Things like that happen if you're working in a code base with other people. Whether we like it or not, we're social. We're, people are reading our code every day. Um, so yeah, just uh, you shouldn't really ever, ever have to test private functions. And if you do, you'll probably have to refactor. But we always don't have time to refactor. So um, I won't get into that much more. Uh, like I said before, PHP unit over, oops. Uh, PHP unit over artisan test, um, a big thing that it gives you over um, artisan test, so if I, uh, oh maybe I do have it there, oh I do, oh, I won't get into it. <laughs> um, with uh, PHP artisan test, it gives you the test names that were run, but the underscores aren't there, so you can't just like copy paste them, so if you do, you 
can actually just grab the function and then just paste it and then run it. That's mainly the reason. And also PHP unit often gives you a bigger stack trace um, right in front of you than uh, PHP artisan test. So it's like little things like that. Um, uh, and then finally, continuous integration. Um, so for those that have uh, like CI set up, uh, there's two tools out there called Travis and Circle CI. Um, I won't, I'm not going to get right into them, um, but essentially, when you do a merge request to uh, like master, if you set it up that way, it'll boot up. Uh, Travis will boot up, build your Laravel application, run all its tests, and then if it comes back as all the tests have run then it will flick it up to GitHub or whatever you're using and be like, yeah, all your tests pass. And then GitHub has an option that you can just like click um, merge. That only becomes clickable if all your tests are actually passed. Uh, so it makes it almost impossible to push out code that is failing unit tests. Um, I think I use Travis. I haven't used CircleCI. And they both work pretty well. Um, just I think, I think recently, Someone was trying to mine Bitcoin using Travis and Circle CI, and I think it was one of them, and blew up the servers or something, and they had to redo a bunch of stuff. So it's, it's just a computer. <laughs> uh, cool. Questions, thoughts, feelings, anything to add? Yeah. Lara casts. That's where I did most of my um, learning in Laravel in general and, and unit testing. Uh, the guy who runs it, this guy Jeffrey Way, he's just really good at explaining stuff and he's just like slow and methodical. And um, yeah, that was a massive change for me as a Laravel developer was LaraCast. And that's why it's same with service containers, service providers. It's actually it's pretty complicated, all that kind of stuff in Laravel. And understanding those patterns, um, every time I work in that part of the code base, you kind of have to go give yourself a wee refresher because it only happens once every couple of months. But those videos have massive helped me. Um, and then also just read the docs. There's a lot of, um, there's a whole section in Laravel around testing that covered most of the stuff I talked about, but I, I got into a few other things. Um, actually, I could, I could di dive into um, reading other people's code is a big one. Like reading library code and all that kind of stuff that also really helped me become a better developer. Um, so like, I think it's contribution contribution guide. So for those that haven't dug into this, um, there's this page in the docs contribution guide and it lists all the Laravel projects um, that Taylor's worked on. Um, and then I think here's Laravel framework. So this is that uh, big piece of code that's in your vendor uh, folder. Um, not the, the thing you install. Um, so if there's uh, Illuminate, so that's got like uh, your queries and stuff in it, the query builder, Eloquent, all that kind of stuff. Uh, if we can go to test here, what are we going to look at? Uh, let's find like collections or something. Or Auth, should we just look at auth? I'm not a big fan of auth. Uh, but yeah, so he's got all these tests here. So you don't, just to make clarify, when you run PHP hours and tests, you aren't running these tests. This has already been deployed, is 100% useful. Um, you just only run these tests when you're developing in the Laravel environment. Um, but they've done not camel, some of the testing is camel casing in the Laravel framework. Um, this isn't actually that great of an example. Uh, let's go back to click. Can we search? Support, yeah, you're right. Nailed it. <laughs> yeah, so there's always test three here. Um, which are pretty good. And you can just learn little things. It's like you kind of forget assert same exists. Um, and then it's just asserting. So this test here, see, it's hard to read, eh? Because there's no underscores. Test cell returns first item in collection if only one exists. So it's just saying, hey, is this where function working correctly? 
on this collection. Um, and it's only getting one back, it looks like. Uh, yeah, but there's a lot less comments in this in the testing than is in the production code for Laravel, which is interesting as well. Um, sometimes you do find bits where you're like, oh, they just threw this together. <laughs> anyway, uh, cool. Anything else? Um, so, if you're testing, when I use them the most um, is when I'm testing services. So, uh, a service class, um, it's not standard in Laravel, but it's kind of a way just to put common code somewhere. Um, there's patterns behind it and, and when you should put stuff there, but I'm not going to get right into it. Um, but you could just write a unit test that, let's say you have like a bunch of different places in the code base of cool and get kittens, but you're like, my controller logic doesn't care if this is working correctly or not. I'm just not going to um, test that in my controller test. I'm going to mock it or spy it. Then you could have one unit test, um, like in here. Uh, test services unit, foo test. Oh, here's that code I lost before, the reflection class for the private function. Um, yeah, so you just test that unit test there. Um, so service classes, I guess, is a, really, is a good example as if you need to test uh, them a lot. Um, I think we had, uh, I've worked in a code base where we had um, one legacy class that was massive and it was a thousand lines long of like computation kind of stuff. And we just had a bunch of unit test functions that hit that because we didn't want our controllers to care about it. They just needed to be able to call it and get a response. That's all they wanted. Um, uh, query, uh, model functions as well. If you, you could test scopes, that could be a unit test. And when you're testing a unit test, you're just calling the class. You're not calling a, a um, feature endpoint. Um, you're not doing a get request or a post request. You're just calling the class. That's what you're doing. Um, yeah, I think it's it might be a few other places, but it's just a unit of code, I guess. Is <laughs> good way to think about it. Cool. Uh, you're taking too long to deliver your project. <laughs> Um, <laughs> the, the, the good way to think about it is your coverage. So you should be aiming for that 90% coverage. Um, and as much as I hate to say it, there would be a, it's a little bit of gut instinct there where you're like, I'm pretty confident this is all going to work well. Um, and you, one unit test for every if statement kind of thing. Maybe one unit test could cover a couple of different if statements at the same time. There's like a little bit of an art to it, but ultimately writing unit tests isn't, isn't as, okay, it's, it's difficult, but it's not as difficult as writing production code. It's harder to write Laravel code than it is to write PHP unit code. Um, I guess it's the kind of the point I've been trying to, to make. Um, so as many as you're comfortable with, I guess is the answer. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> Anything else where you want us to think that they could share something that is super important for unit testing? Oh, yeah. So you're talking about like refresh database and trip. Yep, yeah, good. That's actually a really good point. Um, so one thing I didn't cover. Where did he go? Student controller test. Um, is this guy here, refresh database. So this is a trait. Um, so for those that in PHP, a trait's just a bit of common co code you can just inject into any class. Well, inject's the wrong word, but get. So refresh database, what this will do is um, between, I mentioned this briefly at the beginning, but not in detail, um, between every execution of each test, I think it is, um, it'll c completely wipe out the database and then make a new one um, with uh, uh, from your migrations. So that can actually get pretty slow because if you have 20 migrations or whatever, you could run a test and it would take, it could take five, six seconds to actually start up the boot. I think it does a smart thing where it stores in the cache or something between tests, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, what? So transactions was level five and six were big then and then they introduced this I still prefer transactions personally. 
Um, so you can do, at least level eight, they've gone back. I haven't, I don't know. It might, uh, yeah, I, my understanding was it just used, but you can do this. Um, is it data, but is it transa yeah, transactions? And you can do this instead. And so what this will do instead is you've got to have your testing database built up at the beginning, um, but it will wrap every test in a database transaction, a MySQL transaction. Um, and for those that don't know what a MySQL transaction is, is if a, transac if a query fails, it will roll back to the previous state before the um, transaction. So we'll wrap that entire thing in a transaction. Um, anything fails within the test query code or even the production code, um, it'll roll back. But also, what's interesting about it is that um, in the source code, right at the very end of that trait, it'll throw, essentially just throws an error. So MySQL's like, oh, it failed, I'm gonna roll everything back. But in reality, that's what you wanted. You wanted it to roll back. So it's just like a wee sneaky, um, leverage they use with, with MySQL to, to make it easier to use. Now, I think I've come across a dozen scenarios where I couldn't use database transactions. I think it's full text searching. Doesn't really work that well if you're using database trans. I think it was that, I can't exactly remember. But I have had, had issues where I'm like, why is my code not running? It's working on, and the production code's working, but my testing, this tests are failing, this is crazy. And it was because I was using database transactions. It was doing something wacky. But it's just good to know that <laughs> wacky things can happen. Cool. I think that's everything. Oh. Thanks, guys.